Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more conversations. In a brilliant new book entitled Golden Handcuffs, The Secret History of Trump's Women, New York Times best-selling author and award-winning journalist Nina Burley explores Donald Trump's attitudes toward women by providing in-depth analysis and background on the women who have had the most profound influence on his life. Nina writes that Trump trashed the appearance of woman after woman, flagrantly cheated on all three of his wives, brushed off multiple accusations of sexual assault, publicly ogled his eldest daughter, bought the silence of a porn star and a playmate with whom he allegedly had Congress and bragged about his now infamous grab him seduction technique, all the while claiming that there's nobody that has more respect for women than I do. Nina Burley is with us, and we are pleased to welcome her back to the program. <laughs> now, well said. Nina, yeah. this is a superb uh, book, an su interesting subject, very, very relevant. What led you to write this book, and what led you to write it now? Well, I was in the New York Hilton on the uh, night of the election 2016, watching Donald Trump, uh, who had just been elected president, walk onto the stage, trailed by a following of gazelle-like women on four-inch heels, and uh, all of them sort of looking similar, beautifully ironed hair, model camera-ready faces, short dresses, and I thought, who are these women? And what is their, you know, what, what, it, what would make them stick with uh, this man who had been accused by 19 women of uh, aggressive acts? Furthermore, the abrupt change within one hour of American women expecting, many American women expecting to have as their emissary to the world and leader of this country, a woman, the first female president, Hillary Clinton within an hour, went down in ashes. And within an hour, that had switched to no, the public face of American womanhood is the branded Trump female. These women who have um, remade themselves or made themselves into, um, you know, paragons of the Trumpian vision of the perfect woman, which is this archaic sort of combination of the Hugh Hefner, Playboy Bunny Girl Next Door slash Vegas showgirl slash playmate slash model. And uh, that woman is now the role model for our daughters. Miss from Universe. Miss Universe from the, the uh, up by the bootstraps, sensible shoes, wearing career woman, I could have stayed home and baked cookies, presidential candidate, to wearing four inch heels and participating in the commodification of the feminine for decades with a man who's, who's identified with the ranking of hotness of females for at least two decades. From those, are, those are now our role models role models for our daughters and the public face of American womanhood. And I thought it was worth in exploring. Said to uh, someone, how would you rate Ivanka from one to 10? Uh, extraordinary statement for a father to make about his daughter. But And that's not the least of the not, extraordinary statements that he's made about his daughter. Well, that's so. But let's, before we get to that, I'm always intrigued with titles. And uh, how did you come up with golden handcuffs? And is this uh, a reference to the 2013 events in the uh, Ritz-Carlton Hotel well, in Moscow? I have to say the title, uh, I was using the title Queens of Trump Land. That was my working title. A genius at mm -hmm. Simon & Schuster came up with this title. I think that it's, uh, it, of course, the allusion to the, um, the 2013 uh, Compromat tape is um, not, Repeated. it's not accidental, <laughs> but it really, it's really a reference to the idea, um, uh, you know, that we, the, the metaphor for having a job that you really hate, but you can't walk away from it because the money's too darn good. Uh, you've done a lot of research on Trump, uh, and clearly Trump was very concerned about uh, the, uh, the Ritz-Carlton tape and its existence and what it might show. He, uh, 
anxiously asked Jim Comey about it four times. Uh, do you believe that it could have happened? I think that there is every possibility that there are all sorts of tapes. Um, I think he's been certainly somebody that has been watched for a long time by the Russians. That's absolutely true. They've been paying close attention to him uh, since Ivana, who, by the way, first wife, Czechoslovakia, and behind, raised behind the Iron Curtain, 11 years of Russian. Uh, she, he would have never gone to Russia had he not been married to Ivana the first time. She, she smoothed, smoothed the way for this provincial Queens boy to become comfortable with Slavic people. And he, he spent a lot of time in Czechoslovakia, and he, he, he definitely wouldn't have been in 87 on his first trip to Russia had she not been in his life. And I have, I have family members who agree with me on that, his family members. Well, uh, before uh, we get to the wives, and there have been three, uh, perhaps we could uh, start with uh, uh, the uh, eldest evidence of a woman in his life, his grandmother. Uh, what did your research uncover about her? Well, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Chris Trump. Fascinating story. Um, a lot of the research, uh, the original research into um, Elizabeth Chris Trump comes from Gwenda Blair's biography. I have to give her credit because the, um, the sources on, on her in Kallstadt, which is the tiny town in Germany where the Trumps are from, uh, really are people who aren't around anymore. And, and Gwenda did great work, and I used a lot of that in this book. Elizabeth Chris Trump was the girl next door growing up when Frederick Trump, Trump's grandfather, uh, left from this tiny town, Kallstadt, a wine-growing town in uh, Germany, to come to the United States by himself to make his fortune running saloon brothels around the Gold Rush area in Seattle and then up in the Yukon. After he made some money, he went back to Kallstadt, married the girl next door, who is this, this China doll beauty, blue-eyed, blonde-haired. You see her genes are very strong. You see her in, uh, in Tiffany and Ivanka and Eric. They look a lot like her. And she marries Frederick. He brings her back to New York from this, this idyllic pastoral village. Suddenly she's in teeming, immigrant-filled New York around the turn of the century, of the 20th century. She has three children. She wants to go home. She's tried to go home three or four times. He kept bringing back her back, to Germany. back to Germany, and they wouldn't let them stay because he had, when he was over here making his nut, he had evaded military service, and the Kaiser wouldn't let him come back. So she was stuck here, and suddenly Frederick dies of the Spanish flu. She's left all alone a woman who's German-speaking after World War I, right? Germans are not particularly well-liked, even though there was a huge community of Germans and she was nestled in it. She has this nut of a property in Queens that uh, Frederick had bought, three kids, teenagers and younger, and she incorporated the Trump Company and she started the borrow-build, borrow-build uh, mode of, of development that became uh, the basis of the Trump organization. Her now, son, Donald Trump disputes that. Donald Trump does not dispute it. I don't think he's ever been challenged, but Donald Trump gives all credit to his father, Frederick. Now, Fred, Fred was in high school. He was 13 when she incorporated. There's no way he incorporated. There's no way the borrow, build, borrow, build concept came from the mind of a 13-year-old. She created this company and then as soon as he was out of high school, he went straight to work, even in high school. And the guy was an incredible, um, industrious and uh, thrifty man, Fred Trump, in addition to being a, a canny um, negotiator and deal maker and, and, and user of, of um, <laughs> Brooklyn power types to get more and more money. But he was an, he was an amazingly uh, industrious young man, and he went out and started building these houses uh, after she started the company. But she was the founder of the Trump Organization. So there's the paternal Fishery. line. There's the paternal line, and then you have Trump's mother, Mary, Queen also, of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, exactly. That, that, that is, she she came from Mary McLeod came from a tiny little island in the Outer Hebrides called the Isle of Lewis. I highly recommend it. I visited it. It's beautiful. Uh, but around the turn of the century, again, she was the tenth 
child of a fisherman's family living in a two bedroom peat heated cottage near the tidal flats, basically living in muck boots. And there weren't a lot of husbands, uh, there weren't a lot of men on the island. World War I had killed off a lot of the men. They, uh, a number of them died in this terrible um, uh, shipwreck off the coast right after World War I coming back. 200 men, young men died within sight of the island. So these girls growing up had, uh, there was a, a shortage of husband material. And of course, it was a very impoverished place so to live. So come to the United so States, a mecca for husbands. So she came to the United husbands. States, a mecca for husbands, but also a place where Scots and uh, Irish and Brits were being hired as footmen and nannies and butlers in the great houses of New York, the Gilded Family uh, homes. And I couldn't believe when I went to the New York Public Library, looked in the census to find out where she lived. When she came here, she moved into the Carnegie Mansion and she was a maid. She was one of a retinue of 20 servants, polishing banisters, polishing silver. And that experience, I believe, turned her into a person who was obsessed with the royal, obsessed with trappings of, of royalty and status. Status, uh, you know, that's where she got the, you know, the obsession with watching Queen Elizabeth on television, which Donald Trump writes about in his own uh, book. And, and, you know, completely di different from Fred Trump, the thrifty German immigrant son. Uh, she had a real interest in and, and aptitude and, 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 and yearning, really, for the, uh, the trappings of wealth and luxury. And, of course, it, I really believe that that is Donald Trump's rosebud. His mother's craving for luxury and class and passed, she was a passed down to him whole. And that's why you have every time the word Trump is on a building, it must be guilt and, you know, his... Before it's taken down. Before it's <laughs> taken down and, and, you know, his, his claims that Trump, the, the Trump name equals luxury, which now you see Ivanka uh, saying in, when, in her own books, uh, they believe that the name and the brand is, is e equivalent with luxury. And that comes down from the grandmother. It's all equivalent with bankruptcy, but uh, this is hardly a man who traces his ancestry back to the, the Mayflower Pilgrim. Hardly, uh, but you know, they do, I mean, you have his daughter Ivanka uh, saying, we are America's royal family, and, and they believe that. Royal family, okay. So uh, Trump has a grandmother, and he has uh, a uh, mother uh, and father, and he uh, grows up, and it uh, uh, comes time for uh, a man to leave his father and take a wife. So who's his first wife? His first wife is Ivana Zelnichkova. And she's the Czech. She's the Czech. Ski champion. She is, two of his wives are, are, are James Bond girl villain material. They are beautiful Slavs. And the first one comes over from uh, Czechoslovakia to Canada and then via Canada down to New York. And she was leggy, blonde, beautiful. She shows up at uh, Max's Plum. I believe that's what it's called, the, um, the uh, singles bar, the famous singles bar. No um, longer exists, 65th Street and 3rd Avenue, I can tell you. And, they, and that, that's where she first encounters the, the man of her dreams in his maroon suit and his matching maroon limo and Unlike the New York women, the sophisticates who, who look at him, this boy from Queens, and sort of sneer, and they knew exactly how to class him, this Czech woman, young woman, didn't understand any of those markers. And she thought that he was just the bee's knees and, and you know, the, the very best that American manhood had to offer. And he, of course, pursued her for a year, and she finally um, said yes, and they got married at a, uh, at a at, at, on the Upper East Side uh, at a, an event filled with Fred Trump's political associates, including Mayor Abe Beam and other. Uh, she had maybe three of her own friends there. And she marries into this family. And then 
soon after that. Well, but before she marries, something has to happen that's very important to Trump, and that's called a prenup. Oh, yes, the prenup. Well, the pre yes, this is the first of many Drawn prenups. by Roy Cohn. Drawn by Roy Cohn. <laughs> Let's not leave that out. First of many prenups. Um, he agree, he's proposes marriage to Ivana. His lawyer is Roy, Roy Cohn, the infamous mob lawyer, uh, McCarthy, Joe McCarthy's lawyer, um, a, uh, an infamous figure in New York uh, political history. And Donald, he advises Donald Trump, first of all, he says, don't get married. That's not a good idea. He was closeted gay and probably in love with Donald anyway. He said, don't marry. And then, but if you're going to marry, you really need a contract. And so he wrote a prenup and it almost, it almost capsized the plans because she, uh, she didn't like what they were asking her to do, to sign. And she, she managed to fight back and get some mad money written into it. But the, the original deal was you have to give all your, all his gifts back in addition to everything else. Like and I think $25,000? Something uh, that was very, it was very low amount of money. It was a pittance. And, anyway, and then he, those his things, answer, what, do you know what his answer was when she objected to the terms? I don't remember. He said, well, you know Roy Cohn. He was <laughs> just, <laughs> I don't like it either, but this is what yeah, Roy Cohn This Cone is what did. I have to do. Um, so they, uh, they, they renegotiated it several times actually during, the, during their marriage. But he made her his uh, interior designer. He put her on with these buildings, first at the Grand Hyatt and then Trump Tower, and eventually she climbed the ranks. She turned out to be an actually very good uh, manager of, of employees. And designed business. the Plaza Hotel. And she designed the Plaza Hotel. She, she's responsible for the, the look of the, uh, the lobby in Trump Tower, and he put her in charge of the casinos down in Atlantic City. One of them, he, she, was, she was running 4,000 employees at one time. And then he put her in charge of the plaza. But at that, by that time, she was starting to get credit for being the sort of the woman behind the company, and the, you know because she was so successful, and she was also really good at um, getting press. And, and the press in the '80s obsessed with this pair because they were so over the top. And he was buying; he had bought Mar-a-Lago at the, by this point. Um, and he had his yacht and he was flying so, high and she was this yuppie wife who was sort of his career woman wife and he did not like headlines about how good she was at her job and so that is that was why the beginning the, of the end is that why the marriage collapsed yes it collapsed because uh, he uh, found somebody who was more pliant and more to his he liking. Had a mistress. And he recommended, yes, I mean, he, he had many mistresses, but he had Marla really hung on, Marla Maples, 20, much younger in her 20s, and wanted to be an actress, wanted to be a model. And with Marla Maples, he, you know, his, his entire uh, business capsized. I mean, you know, this is when he goes from, um, you know, married and having this thriving business with all these toys. Uh, yachts and airplanes and so on to $900 million in debt and this very demanding mistress who he's having to hide all over uh, hither and yon from Atlantic City to New York. And then finally he comes up, op opens the, the relationship becomes open to the public and he starts to, even though he's in this sort of disastrous moment, the experience of having to deal with the press in in that time and he learned to be his own fake PR man that he rose to the PR challenge and he well he had, he had Marla Rosario. saying had Marla saying it was the best sex she ever had yes but if you if you if you talk to people at the New York Post there are people who say that was him phoning in that quote and he had her on the oh, phone said, Marla tells me here she is Ex Absolutely. Okay, so his marriage to Ivana lasts how long? Fifteen years? Uh, Roughly. Something like that. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, 13, 12, and, 13 years. And then he best. marries Marla. Marla's pregnant when he marries her. Marla's, no, Marla's given birth. Oh, given birth already. Uh, everything about the Marla uh, so Tiffany. episode is very, he, he was in the room, you know, he's a germaphobe and he has a real, he's really repelled by female biology. And he somehow she managed to talk him into being in the room with her when she gave birth to Tiffany. And then three months later, they got married at a, a wedding, which again was filled with Trump, uh, you know, 
C-list um, Hollywood folks and a also lot of, Hil and Hillary a lot of and Bill political Clinton? people. Hillary and Bl Bill well, Clinton. Hillary and Bill show up at the Melania wedding in Mar-a-Lago, which is a, that was fit for Marie Antoinette. That's a whole other thing. B Bill and Hillary are not at the Marla wedding. O.J. Simpson was at the Marla wedding, um, and you know the sort of B-list actors from the from the uh, early '90s. And they said there was not a wet eye in the house. <laughs> yeah, well, Howard Stern, <laughs> Howard Stern literally walked in and said to the press, I don't think this is going to last Right. at the wedding. And that one only lasted six years. It only lasted six years. And again, the end time is a little uh, bit fuzzy because it, it, it lasted slightly beyond the moment in which the, um, the Miami Beach police <laughs> found her at 4 a.m. under a lifeguard uh, point a, li a lifeguard stand with uh, one of her bodyguards in what lawyers call in flagrante delicto. Apparently, yes. and that was the um, that was the beginning of the end. Beginning of the end. And it was, and of course, hit that prenup uh, was uh, much more stingy. I think she only got two million dollars. Melania comes on the scene. What do we know about her? Well, Melania, like Ivana, is born in a shoe factory town in backwoods uh, uh, Slovenia. Um, and her father was a kind of a gearhead, uh, bit of a thug, drove, his, drove the mayor around and really liked to collect Mercedes. His, her mother was uh, a pattern maker at a, at a clothing factory. So she grew up in a pretty lower middle class, um, somewhat um, not quite as uh, restricted as the Czechs because Slo Slovenia was part of Yugoslavia and they had access to the West, but not as much. And so they longed for the brands of the West. Like Ivana, these people were behind the Iron Curtain, even in the 70s when Milani was growing up. Having a Coke, having a Coca-Cola was like a special treat for her. Um, getting Western clothes was a special treat. Getting to cross the border into Italy and buy Western branded jeans was a big deal. So she grew up. Uh, you know, not a terribly curious young woman, doodling fashions, um, going to school with her sister, uh, who, to whom she was very, with whom she's very close to this day. And she was, she grew up to be a stunning young woman. And by the age of 16, a photographer spotted her, a Slovenian photographer, and made a modeling portfolio for her. And from then on, she was on this career path into the modeling world. And she ended up uh, in Milan and then in Paris and then eventually washed up in New York in the around 96 or so uh, at a point at which lots and lots of Eastern European women were coming here uh, to enter the modeling industry or to become actresses or, or and, and she was, she, so, the, so the, there were so many of them coming in that the value uh, of these beauties was dropping. Furthermore, she was already in her mid-twenties and in the modeling, the merciless modeling industry, that is too old. So when she arrived here, she really needed uh, somebody like a Trump who liked to brand, mold, and get mm -hmm. deals for his women. And it was a match made in heaven. Uh, now, that marriage has lasted 13 years, not quite so long as uh, the marriage to Ivana, but longer than and, the well, marriage to Well, they've been to together for a lot longer than that. And they've been together for longer. I mean, they've been uh, together since my sources said at least in, in 96, which is longer than they admit to having known each other. But she was already, she already knew him in 96 when she was taking those photographs. The, he the kind of had an obsession photograph. with having women in his life pose nude. I mean, he wanted uh, Marla Maples to pose nude. She refused to do it. Uh, Melania yeah. had posed nude in, uh, in pictures. This is really a man who has participated in and really led the branding and commodification and pornification of the feminine for the last 30 years. Okay, so then if he right. likes women so much, uh, he wants to brand them and pornify them. Uh, why does he say such disparaging things about him? I mean, uh, Stormy Daniels was horse face. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren is Pocahontas. Uh, you he know, talked about, they're uh, fine when they're pliant, and when they rebel, it's, it provokes a kind of a, pr a primal anger, I think. They, they're supposed to be pliant. So does he like women, or does he hate women? <laughs> it's so funny. You're the, everyone who I've talked to about this book has asked me that. I think he <laughs> likes women. I mean, he likes women in his own way. 
Uh, I think if you sat down with him and you're a woman and you're not um, somebody who's antagonizing him, I think he can be very charming. Stormy Daniels' lawyer uh, calls Trump a disgusting misogynist. Is, so I have a question for you. Is Donald Trump a disgusting misogynist? Well, I think he's, he's pretty disgusting. He's an oaf. And is he a misogynist? Uh, yeah, I think that his behavior indicates, the behavior towards women, it indicates that he is misogynistic at, at a very fundamental level. Yeah, he's, he's misogynistic. Misogynistic. He at cannot look at women without, he does not look at women as fellow humans. They, they're, they're, they're set pieces for business. Uh, you know, they're, they're things to look at to make yourself look better because you're, fellow captains of industry or, or, or entertainers are going to be jealous of you if you have a beautiful one next to you. It's, it's all about, uh, you know, the female as a, as a set piece and an accessory. And that is a misogynistic attitude towards women. Certainly. Women are set pieces and accessories. Nita Burley, this has been marvelous. And thank you so much for coming by. You're welcome. And good luck with your book. I think thank it's going to be a red hot bestseller. And when <laughs> I say red hot, I speak advisedly. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.